All right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. And our first guest on the show today is John Pfeffer, co-director of Foreign Policy in Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies. The website is fpif.org and second only to antiwar.com. Boy, do they have a great stable of writers over there at uh, Foreign Policy in Focus. Welcome back to the show. John, how are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks for having me again on your show. Well, I'm very happy to have you here. And hey, I'll be the first to admit that part of the reason that antiwar.com is so great is because we link to stuff by your guys all the time. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, we have some great stuff up on the site right now. So I encourage folks to head over there if they're interested in the latest on foreign policy. Absolutely. And your latest here is Two Leaders, Two Deaths about uh, Vaclav Havel. And Kim Jong Il. I guess first of all, let's talk a little bit about uh, the former. There, uh, he was a poet, right? Who helped overthrow the commies? He was a playwright, a and playwright. Uh, he mm-hmm, and he worked tirelessly uh, to kind of create a kind of civil society in the Czech uh, Republic or what was Czechoslovakia. And he spent many years in jail, kind of ruined his health. But he managed, uh, when the opportunity arose in the fall of 1989, to pull together what has been called the Velvet Revolution, uh, uh, uprising against the Czech communists that basically swept them out of the way and without any violence or uh, any uh, death. Now, what happened there? They just marched right in and the numbers were so overwhelming, the cops just put their guns down or stood out, stood back or what? How did it go? Well, basically, I mean, we have to remember that things had already been changing in Eastern Europe at the time. Uh, so we had, in 1989, in uh, June uh, 4th of 1989, the first uh, semi-free elections in Poland, and the Solidarity Trade Union Movement had uh, taken virtually all the seats that were available uh, for it to, to take. And that was an incredible inspiration for folks in the region. I mean, they saw this uh, a huge trade union movement of t- nearly 10 million people and a, and a population of 40 million uh, basically overwhelm the Polish Communist Party. Uh, the second really important thing is Gorbachev. Gorbachev and the Soviet Union basically said, hey, you guys, he said to the communist parties in Eastern Europe, you guys, I'm not going to support you any longer. Uh, you can maintain control if you can maintain control, but we're not going to send in the Russian troops as we did in, in uh, Czechoslovakia in 68 or Hungary in 56. And suddenly these guys were isolated. So uh, the solidarity took the first advantage of it. And then you had, uh, you know, mass demonstrations beginning in East Germany, and you had mass demonstrations in uh, Prague in Czechoslovakia as well. And it was just a huge number of people. I mean, it was started by people like Václav Havel and some of his, uh, some of the key people who were in the Charter 77 movement, which, which was really a small group of people, but. You had this opportunity in 1989, and everybody in, in Czechoslovakia realized that the writing was on the wall. They came out for a demonstration. They were not going to be shot at, and they basically overwhelmed the authorities. Yeah. You know, I feel bad for people who are too young to remember this. Um, it took, you know, I guess a couple of years, and I was only, you know, a young teenager, but uh, I was paying close attention and and it really was unprecedented in the entire history of the world. However many, what, tens of millions of people, maybe hundreds, uh, freed in an uh, almost bloodless thing. I mean, from, from, you know, the tip of Northern Europe all the way around into, down into Afghanistan and, and, uh, to the, you know, east and Siberia. People set free all at once in a way that well, you couldn't, no, no playwright could have come up with it and sold it to anyone. That's right. And, and it was unexpected in many way, ways. I mean, I arrived in Poland in January of 1989, and no one expected anything to be changing that year. Uh, and a few weeks after I arrived in Poland, the government announced that it would begin negotiations with the Solidarity Trade Union movement. But even then, people didn't think that that was going to be a, a, a tremendous uh, change in Poland, much less in the region as a whole. I left Poland after the elections in June, I was, and I traveled south, and I went through 
Prague. Uh, this would have been in uh, late July, early August of uh, 1989, and it was quiet. There was nothing going on there, uh, and I eventually left, you know, the region, and I watched all those events take place in the fall of 1989 from, from the United States, and it was just, it, it was as if it came out of nowhere. Yep. Well, and it really what it came down to was just economics, right? Like they couldn't afford to put down revolutions all over Europe if they'd had to, right? Well, it was it was both economics, but it was also, you know, they didn't have the Soviet support any longer. And so, however, however ruthless Well, I guess that's who I meant. The, the Soviet systems uh-huh. economy was basically uh-huh. just done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the Soviet Union had had overextended itself, uh, could no longer afford, you know, its its huge military, and certainly couldn't afford uh, to to prop up these folks in the region. Uh, the one, thank the goodness, one we're immune was, to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we should have followed the the lead there and and understood that you know unbelievable expenditures on the military would eventually bankrupt a country but uh you know china was not interested in propping up the soviet union back in the late 1980s and they're more interested in propping us up so i suppose that's the key difference right so now you say in this article this guy havel he really wasn't much of a leader uh, once he got in power, but his real legacy is helping to overthrow the Communist Party. Well, you know, he we have to be we have to be even handed here. I mean, he he did preside over uh, in some important kind of transitional periods in in Czechoslovakia and then subsequently the Czech Republic, and he did so with reasonably um, you know with reasonable aplomb. In other words. Uh, there were, were increased tensions between the Czech and Slovak people, and the two sides managed to come up with an amicable divorce uh, without any bloodshed. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty difficult to come by in, in history, to have a, a divorce of that nature. Uh, obviously, you see what happened with Yugoslavia uh, a couple years after that. Mm-hmm. So uh, so that was important. He, he managed to usher the Czech Republic into the European Union and the first wave of uh, Eastern European countries joining the, the, the European Union. And that was important. Uh, economic prosperity more or less came to the Czech Republic. But what he wanted to make uh, as his legacy was really transforming what states do. And, you know, we're, we're so familiar with states kind of acting in uh, immoral or amoral ways. And Václav Havel said, no, I mean, we states should act morally. And as the president of the Czech Republic, I will act morally. I will come up with a moral foreign policy. So some of the things he did was he invited the Dalai Lama to Prague, and, and that pissed off the Chinese. But he said, look, you know, I, even though this is not economically beneficial to the Czech Republic, I'm going to go ahead and do it because it's the right thing to do. He took a look at, you know, how much money the Czech Republic was making on arms exports, and, and Czechoslovakia was sending uh, tanks and guns all over the world, said, this is not right. This is fueling wars and conflicts all over the world. We will not do this any longer. Uh, he took a look at the European security structure. He said, NATO doesn't have any reason to exist any longer. So let's have a, a European security structure that focuses on conflict prevention, not on, you know, uh, creating instability in future wars. And those all sounded great. But unfortunately, he was not able to actually realize those uh, principles in policy. Yeah. Well, that can be hard <laughs> to, to make a brand new state that acts different than all the other states that came before. Good luck. All right. Well, uh, we're going to hold it right there. We're going to talk about the new communist man in North Korea here in a little while. Uh, right after this break, uh, Kim Jong-il has died as well. And uh, we'll be reviewing his legacy and... Maybe get a couple of predictions on what's to come there. Right after this with John Pfeffer. All right, y'all. Welcome back to this here thing. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with John Pfeffer. He's the, what you call it again? Co-director of Foreign Policy in Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies. FPIF.org is the web address. And uh, 
now the big news uh, all over TV. Uh, Kim Jong-il is dead. Uh, dear leader, as the people call him, at least when they're in public. <laughs> I'm not sure what they say about him uh, behind closed doors over there in North Korea. But anyway, he's gone. And uh, I wonder, John, I guess, you know, first of all, give us a little bit of a taste of uh, the life and times of uh, the great dictator there. And then, you know, I really want to pick your brain about where you think we're going from here now that he's out of the way. Sure. So Kim Jong-il is the son of Kim Il-sung, the kind of George Washington, if you will, of North Korea, the first uh, leader. And uh, Kim Jong-il took over in 1994 on his father's death, and he became only the second leader of North Korea. He immediately basically declared a three-year mourning period, and during that period, North Korea basically fell apart. Um, and uh, it was already heading in a downward direction, economically speaking, but it descended into a major food crisis and a famine that killed as much as 10% of the population. Um, managed, however, to kind of uh, pull North Korea out of its tailspin by the end of the 1990s um, and uh, engaged in negotiations with the United States over the nuclear program, with South Korea over economic engagement, with China and Russia about preserving their alliances. And uh, when talks broke down with uh, the United States and the six-party talks, guided North Korea into the nuclear club uh, and one of the, the few countries of the world that actually belonged to this nuclear club. Uh, another kind of uh, success for Kim Jong-il was preserving the regime uh, in general from regime change and a number of the other kind of uh, countries in that category, such as Iraq under Saddam Hussein or Serbia under uh, Slobodan Milosevic or Libya under Muammar Gaddafi, all of them suffered uh, regime change, uh, principally at the hands of the U.S. military. But Kim Jong-il managed to preserve North Korea um, and its structures. Uh, there was an enormous price, of course, that the North Korean people have paid for that, um, you know, upwards of 150, 200,000 people in labor camps, uh, continued malnutrition, uh, economy that barely functions. So that's kind of the legacy of Kim Jong-il. I mean, there are a lot of people in North Korea, I'm sure, who feel that, you know, he managed to keep the country together, and there's a strong feeling of North Korean nationalism. On the other hand, he was not a particularly charismatic leader. I doubt uh, that he was much loved by the people of North Korea. Uh, unlike his father. And so my guess is that a lot of people in that country are just kind of waiting and seeing what's going to come next. Mm. Well, now, um, I've seen pictures of these giant developed cities and all these, uh, you know, fancy 21st century freeways and everything, but everything's just empty because everybody's inside. Was it, I mean, I understand, uh, you know, it's a communist system with a, uh, a very tight control over trade and the economy, but how brutal is that police state? Is this the kind of thing where guys in black come and get people in the middle of the night on a regular basis for anybody dare say a peep? Basically, um, you know, it's a, there's a system uh, in North Korea that dates back many, many hundreds of years uh, in both the Korean and Chinese system of punishing uh, families for the acts of individuals. So if an individual says something, uh, it could be an inadvertent comment about the leadership. Uh, it could be something as seemingly innocuous as folding a picture of uh, of the leader, uh, Kim Jong-il or Kim Il-sung, uh, because you're not supposed to alter a picture in any way. Uh, someone could be trundled off to a labor camp, and their whole family would be punished as well. So this is a pretty, this is a pretty brutal system. Um, but uh, it's also a system in which people have pushed at the limits of what's possible. So they engage in private market activity, some of which is uh, more or less legal, some of which is illegal. They, uh, many people now have cell phones, uh, so upwards of a million people in North Korea out of a population of approximately 25 million uh, have cell phones. So it's the elite for the most part, people who are engaged in um, – economic uh, deals with China and other countries. So you have a growing kind of middle-class elite in North Korea, but you still have vast 
uh, tracks of poverty and underdevelopment in the country. Mm. All right. Now, I just wanted to uh, – we don't have time to discuss this, I don't think, but I wanted to mention to the audience that if they will Google your name, John Pfeffer, and mine, uh, or just uh, go to antiwar.com slash radio, start looking through the archives there, we've spoken in detail in the past at length about – uh, how it was that North Korea came into nuclear weapons, as you just mentioned, how Bush pushed North Korea to nukes, as uh, Gordon Prather put it in his last article for antiwar.com before he retired. Uh, and I highly recommend people take a listen to that because there are lessons in it for Iran and, and other situations around the world as well. But um, I want to ask you now if you can, and I'm sure, by the way, you've written about that as well. Am I right? I forget now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, fpif.org, you can find John Pfeffer's uh, writings on that topic as well. All right, now, um, so uh, what about Kim Jong-il's son? I already forgot his name. I saw a picture on TV, but it looked like it was shot from really far away or something like that. <laughs> is 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 uh, Does he have the backing of the military? Is there uh, any rumor of how ruthless he is or isn't or anything like that? Well, he's only about 29 years old, so, you know, his only reputation is, at the moment is for studying in Switzerland, uh, enjoying basketball, and liking Eric Clapton. So he hasn't really developed a reputation for ruthless. Eric Clapton, huh? yet. That doesn't bode well. <laughs> um, there are rumors, of course, that he was responsible for the shelling of Yonpyeong Island, a uh, South Korean island that is in a disputed maritime area, but there really is no evidence of that. Um, he, like his father, has no military experience, but because of the nature of the North Korean system, you don't get anywhere politically without military backing. Kim Jong-un also has uh, you know, military backing. He himself has been declared a general, even though, as I said, he has no experience. Um, it's difficult to know what direction he's going to go in. Obviously, he has some experience in the West, uh, on the other hand, he's operating in a system that is uh, is, is like a straitjacket. It's extremely difficult to, to move one way or another. And complicating the issue is that it's a Confucian society in which young people are supposed to show deference to their elders. And while it's true that Kim Il-sung actually took over as quite a young man, he killed off anybody who might challenge him. Um, Kim Jong-un is not going to have quite that uh, opportunity. So it's likely that uh, Kim Jong-il's brother-in-law, Jung sung Tech, will possibly be the power behind the throne. It's likely that the military will pull the strings, um, at least in the short term. So uh, at, least, at least for the next period of time, we're probably not going to see any dramatic changes in North Korea. On the other hand, you know, if the United States and other countries offer some attractive opportunities to sit down and talk about the nuclear program, uh, to consider a rehab of North Korean infrastructure, to open up a path for it to, to join the international community in one way or another. That could push Kim Jong-un uh, and his backers within the North Korean elite in a direction more favorable to reform. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, late last week, the State Department was claiming progress in uh, talks with the North Koreans, uh, saying they're going to ship some food aid, and the North Koreans are going to do what in response now? The other side of the deal? Well, um, yeah, I mean, the North Korea basically has requested food aid, uh, has done so for the last couple of years, basically, uh, and the United States is just getting around to considering some humanitarian relief. Um, there has been there have been some. There was a small shipment that went out in September that was. Uh, Kind of humanitarian shipment. Um, in uh, in response, you know, North Korea is you know willing to sit down. Uh, has said that it's willing to sit down to nuclear negotiation, and that's the key thing that the United States is interested in. It wants to get more information about, in particular, uranium enrichment uh, activities that North Korea has. Well, made. they even floated freezing it for now, right? Yep, and uh, also free, have a moratorium on missile launches. Um, so there's some positive signs coming out of North Korea if we're willing to take them up on it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if that's too much to hope for, but uh, I'm going to hope anyway. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time, John, as always. 
Thanks for having me on the show. Everybody, that's John Pfeffer, co-director of Foreign Policy in Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies, FPIF.org. And his newest piece today is Two Leaders, Two Deaths, 